are familiar with Amy Law, we have um, we set up our themes in quarters, okay? and each quarter is dictated by the stars in the sky. So as navigators, we use four different star ohana, or star families. And this one that we're in right now is called Keika Omakali'i. Everybody say Keika Omakali'i. Keika Omakali'i. And so who better than to bring somebody who is very familiar with Makali'i, the canoe, okay, out on the west side. And I'm going to introduce her. Introduce you to her right now. If you can please stand. Everybody, this is Kiala Kahua Nui. Can I get it? <laughs> Kiala. Okay, so Kikau Makali'i has everything to do with the idea of sustainability. And when they asked me, okay, when the committee asked me, who do you want to bring on for, um, for this quarter's wayfinding talk? I said, okay, the theme is sustainability. The first thing I think about is food, yeah? Okay. So, if I want to think about food, because uh, they had asked me, okay, what's, who are the environmentalists that you took in the canoe to talk to all of these big delegates, um, talk about the oceans and all these different stuff, and I was like, I listened to names, but I told them, if you really want to know about sustainability, you find the person who plants the meals, who packs them all away, who weighs them, who stores them, who cooks the food and keeps everybody healthy and happy. Yes. She understands <laughs> sustainability like nobody else. <laughs> Kiala, she had the arduous task of doing all of those things, and on top of that, she was watch captain. That's a huge responsibility, um, responsibility on the canoe. She was also assistant quartermaster, who is in charge of pretty much packing, storing, knowing where everything is, yeah? and then how to pull it out so the weight is even on the canoe. That's hard stuff. You got me really off the mind. She is. And <laughs> I don't have to say anything else. <laughs> I'm building you up right <laughs> And then on top of that, she was our cook. And I'm telling you right now, if you, maybe some of you have heard about lentils, Okay, I never tasted a lento that tasted that good until Kahunui <laughs> cooked it. So, without further ado, once again, Kiala Kahunui. Um, just a little chant, um, composed by a kupuna from the Olelo no Eao book, uh, wise sayings, wise proverbs, talking about how uh, we have arrived. Makali, the canoe have arrived. I am only who my people are, and um, I cannot speak from myself um, because I am not only from myself, I am from my Va'o Ohana Makali, and um, thank you again for inviting me. Now, food. Like Ceci, she can speak hours on food. <laughs> and so we started um, thinking about food, of course, but let's look at sustainability. You and I know exactly what sustainability is, but I also have my Mo'opuna in the house, so we're going to break it down a little bit. And they're good readers too, so I don't have to read it for them. But to me, I think sustainability, being sustainable, really is about malama kokuliana, taking care of our responsibilities. And so um, another easy, simple manao or thought is that something is able to last and continue on. And so when we think about sustainability, of course, we're going to think about our food, 
our water provisions. And yes, that's a huge, huge task all in itself. Um, we also think about where they're going to go, those tasks of being a quartermaster and what, what hole they're going to sit in, where they're going to live, how much they weigh, um, packing them from land to the canoe. And um, I also want to talk about our human resources. Because again, without the practice of va'akaurua, voyaging canoes, we have nothing to eat or need to feed the canoe if we don't even have the people to continue the practice of the canoe. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna touch on that. And I'm sure you got questions about food and water um, because the voyage is still on. And in about 2017, <coughs> Makali'i, our home canoe on the west side in Kauai Hai is gonna join Hokulea. So when Hokulea returns back into the Pacific, it's our goal to get Makali'i uh, voyage ready and provisioned um, with Aipona, Aipono, Aiola, to um, set off and meet Hokulea in the South Pacific and then come home together. So we have lots of work to do, family. Um, so Chad Paishan is my senior captain and navigator, and he had put a call out to all the school gardens and asked them if they could help us to provision the canoe in a whole better way. And um, they said yes. And so check out your school gardens. They're doing great things, um, learning how to dry, um, salt, um, dehydrate, um, even packaging matters, right? So what kind of pono packaging can happen um, for our next voyage? Um, that, that's super exciting. But again, I also want to talk about our human resources. And once I got to Ohana Makali'i, I knew right away that this family is heavy in Kuleana. The stories of this man, everybody know this man? Aye. P.S. Mao P.I. Look, he is steeped in Kuleana sustainability. And so when asked in 1976, Mao, would you help us Hawaiians sail from Hawaii to Tahiti? What did he say? Yes. But did you know his chief said no? His chief said, this is a knowledge this is the EK for your sons and your grandsons. Never mind go Hawaii and go in Niele, perhaps. But his grandfather says, no, son, you must go. And so he did. He chose to go. And for 30, nearly 40 years, he sacrificed and committed himself to teach us. But not only out of goodness of his heart to teach us, but because he's noticing that in, on his own island, Satuau, one mile by one and a half mile, nobody was really interested in wanting to learn navigation anymore. So his idea was to plant the seed in Hawaii so that if someday Satuau needs to know how and they don't know how, they can come where? Hawaii. Hawaii. So he is thinking sustainable. He is planting for future generations. So people like, I need you to meet Shorty Bergman. He said yes in 1976 too on the first voyage. He said, yes, I will learn the ways of a navigator. His brother Clay, he too said yes. I will be the captain. I will learn to be a captain. And what a good captain he was in that he had trained many of Hokulea's um, crew members with a high standard of safety, um, high work ethics, and that's the sustainability also that continues on from these three men. <sighs> a little uh, sensitive because this captain of mine has passed away now uh, for 11 years. Clay Berman realized that um, the canoe needs to live on beyond his own years. And so he starts to set the kahua, or the foundation. So he goes to seek wisdom, counsel from elders like Kupuna Marie Solomon of Kohala. And I just realized that Kamaka's uh, family, this is, this is his grandmother. Um, she is connected to a voyaging heiau in Kohala where her great grandfather was one of the last to uh, be a student at a heiau, a voyaging heiau in Kohala. So Kupuna like Kupuna Marie Solomon, elders like Hale Makua, Uncle, Uncle Clay <laughs> sought their wisdom and needed their advice because he knew this was beyond just him. 
within our community, he also solidified four other organizations. One of them is our own, our Ohana Makali, our crew members, our family. That's a given. They're going to be committed to building a Kanu someday. But he also used these four organizations to um, solidify this foundation. One of them was the traditional warriors who are steeped in the knowledge of ceremony, of protocol, of traditional um, canoes, and they handle our, our Ava ceremonies. They handle the spiritual side of our canoe. And we have um, actually members of, family members of Maikui um, that are pictured here. Again, some of these men and women are no longer here with us, but they still stand as um, huge supporters of our Ohana Makali. Another one is uh, Halau. This Halau has a uh, the huge kuleana to maintain the stories, the songs, the dances connected to our canoe voyages. And this is Halau Ke Ala Ona Maupua, head by Kumu Case. Pua Case, that is. He was so smart to hit the schools. And back in the day when we were in elementary, we remember having elder um, men and women, kupuna, coming to our classrooms to teach us our culture, songs, colors, numbers, basic Hawaiian. And through the kupuna program, um, a lot of the chants that had to do with the canoe, um, the stories from the building of the canoe to the sailing of the canoe were instrumental um, through these kupuna programs that hit statewide, not just Hawaii Island, but statewide. And then our fourth group, and Waimea is just starting as well, Punana Leo Waimea. This is a Hawaiian immersion language <coughs> preschool. And it was smart of him to connect the babies to the kupuna and everywhere in between to help be that foundation for our canoes and ensure that sustainability. He went to seek them again because he was wanting to make a canoe for his brother. So Shorty said he has to be a navigator. Shorty needs a canoe. And so Clay says, well, I'll build him a canoe. And so he seeks the wisdom of the kupuna. But they say, before you go build a fiberglass modern canoe, go walk the walk. Build a traditional one. Everybody say, wow. Go ahead. Because that's no easy task, right? Clay at the time, he was a paniolo and Parker Ranch, and so was the rest of his buddies. So um, this wasn't just, oh, yeah, go look up the manual for um, building canoes, right? The manual was your kupuna. Your manual was your connection to your ancestors, to your higher beings, and um, guided them. Some of them never spoke Hawaiian in their lifetime, but in times when they needed to in ceremony, they would just be speaking like it wasn't even them. So they were vessels um, who were at the right place at the right time to build such canoe named Mauloa. So they built Mauloa. They also even built um, Makali'i in 1995. They do two voyages in 95. They meet their other cousins down in South Pacific, um, seven other canoes down there. And um, in 99, they sell Papa Mao to his island, Satawa home. Soon after that, Papa Mao's all, he asks his three sons, he asks his Hawaiian sons, who will build me? When will you build me a canoe? Now, Papa Mao's got canoes of his own, but they're, um, they can only fit like seven people. They can only uh, carry so much water and, and food that they have to turn around in about seven days and come back to the atoll. So Papa was talking about one of our Hawaiian canoes. How can his people travel long distances like we have? So he asked his sons, who will and when will you build me a canoe before I pass? Clay, without a, without a thought, said, I will build you that canoe. So this canoe is called Alengano Maisu. Uh, Papa Mao named that name. It's a name for the wind in um, Sakawal, his little atoll on the Caroline Islands. And this wind will blow and knock the breadfruit off the tree. 
Now there's various breadfruit trees, but this one is one that you've never seen before. It is huge. Um, it's huger than this opening here, maybe like two times this. Okay? And so the ulu trees, the breadfruit trees, uh, you, you would own your own trees. So you would feed from them like they're your pantry. But on a windy day, and if that wind came and it blew it down, that anybody could go and grab that breadfruit and feed themselves. He felt he was just like that wind. That he came and he shook it up. But it's up to us to go and get that ike, that knowledge, that food of knowledge to um, sustain ourselves. And so he named this vessel um, that we built in Kwai Hai, and not just the Makali Ohana, people from all over came to help build this. This was a canoe of gratitude. So there was a guy in Japan who was taking photographs. He heard of what was going on. He got on the next plane, and he came there to a, a warehouse in uh, Kauai Hai. There were guys from Micronesia, Papa Mao's grandsons, sons, nephews. There were people from Tahiti. Um, we had languages that um, we, 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 we couldn't even respond to each other. Just, you know, the eyebrows and the head nods and eating time. But everybody was filled with gratitude. They just wanted to say thank you to Papa Mao in a way um, that they couldn't. You know, you can't just write a card to a guy like Mao, you know? You, you, gotta, you gotta put your actions where your mouth is. And so, um, Different Va'ohana built different parts of the canoe, and they would then just ship it over to Kauai Hai for us to put it back together again. Okay? So we sailed this canoe in 2007, um, and that was my first voyage. Uh, the center there is uh, Shorty Bertelman again. And um, so right above Shorty is two wiser women. <laughs> And um, those two lived at the warehouse in Kwai Hai. Um, the one on the right is Auntie Kanani Kahalehoi. She lives in Hana. Um, she she le literally left her family and community, lived in the warehouse to continue the work. Um, at this point, Clay Berderman had passed away. But his legacy still lived on in that we will, we will do what our captain says and finish the job. And um, the one to the left of um, Uncle Shorty is Patty and Solomon, little did I know, that's Kamaka's um, auntie. Um, he's in the front desk or up front. And um, they, she too is from Kohala. She's, she's um, Kupuna Marie, Solomon's daughter. And she too lived in the warehouse. And she kept, they kept all the boys straight and made sure that there weren't any arguments. You know, they, they, they were the mama hen, the dorm hens there. Um, so, time to pick the crew. Yeah, it was a given. Shorty knew of Patty Ann and um, Auntie Kanani very well for many years, so she, he picked them. And Patty Ann looked at um, Shorty and said, Shorty, um, it's time. You need to let these girls go. If we don't let them go, then why have we been training them? Let them go for what? That longest leg. From Hawaii to Majuro was our first leg. And that's in our, in our canoes, that's about a month. So she wanted to make sure we got that deep learning, that long learning, not just a little island hopper of three days, nine days, you know? You can still see the other island kind. She really wanted us to experience that long, deep ocean. Um, and there's no other simulation. You just gotta go out there and do it. And Shorty disagreed. He was like, oh man, I don't know those guys. He does it. Clay trained us. So he, he didn't know what we were capable of doing. Um, he was the navigator, and so he just did the homework of navigating, and he didn't really know us crew very well, our up-and-coming crew. But um, Patty Ann gave up her seat, and she told the same to Auntie Kanani. And Auntie Kanani says, no, I want to go. <laughs> so hoo-hoo, Auntie Dolly goes home to Hannah, cries to her husband, and her husband says, you know Patty Ann's right. You got to go this And of course she did. And they gave up their seats for us. And so in that idea of sustainability, right, she, they could have kept that, their seat. They earned it. No doubt they earned it. But they knew that in order for us to have that experience, we got to be out there. We got to do it and live it. And so they met us at our next stop 27 days later at Majuro. 
and they continued on with us side by side after that. And then they got to see for themselves that, yep, we made a good decision. These girls needed to be out there. And so forever am I in their debt because um, I, I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now if it wasn't for the lessons and examples of these fine women um, to show us what it means to be sustainable. So someday soon, I got to give up my seat too. And that's just how it is. Of course, we're going to kick and scream. <laughs> so, that's Papa Mao's statement. He told guys like my Chad Paishan and, and um, guys like Shorty, you guys are too old. And that was an ego killer for him. Because they're like, what are you talking about? We're in our prime. We're in our 20s, 30s. And he says, no, you want to be a navigator, you give me your sons and your grandsons. Ah, so what does that tell us? Akmal said that the mothers were the first navigational teachers. Why? Because they sang the songs. They did the little hand games. They did the little chants that was steeped in a lot of the traditions. And now you just need the application as they got older. But they already had the foundation. And so we followed that example. Our schools, like the immersion schools of Puna Naleo, um, we were in there, and the kids were on the canoes. They were um, learning way sooner than many of us were. And so these are the early beginnings. They, we taught them their, um, their culture, their, their songs, their chants. We taught them their ceremonies. Yeah? Now they can apply them. That's their hoike. That's their exhibition of excellence. We've taught them, of course, the malama the aina from Malka, from the from the uplands, even to the ocean. On our canoes, our mama canoe, Okulea, they train and they train hard to be one with each other before even sailing. And here they are, getting to put that into application. Um, two of them that you're going to see most of right now, they were on the same leg as Ceci and I. They were those keiki at Punanaleo. They were those keiki who, uh, Kaniela right here, he was in his mama's belly when Makali was first put in the water and a double rainbow appeared. And look at him now, 18 years later, um, being part of that Kuleana, part of that sustainability. I was the cook, as you heard um, Ceci speak of, and as a parent, we, um, we drag our kids everywhere. They get to learn exactly what we do by doing, and it's not enough for them to just know how to sail. They need to have other skills, too, that will make them more well-rounded and appreciate lunch, dinner, <laughs> breakfast, and so... Um, we were out of pancakes on the left picture, but I knew that Leoho knew, because she comes from a Paniolo family, she knew how to make Paniolo pancakes. And all that is is just uh, flour, water, sugar, and a little secret sauce. Um, <laughs> but that was simple, something that she knows of home, that she could apply on a canoe to her other home and feed her people. And I wanted her to experience that. It's always an honor to serve, um, even as a cook. And that's... Um, Kaniella, at this point we did have pancake batter, and he's uh, whipping it up. <laughs> this is a special day. I don't know if you um, recognize the man in the in the red visor. That's um, Jacques Cousteau's son, Jean Michel, um, Jean Michel, yeah. And then the uh, uh, wiser woman there, that's um, Silvio Gray. Earl. Sylvia Earl, yeah, woman who made the most deepest dives, uh, most number of dives until just last year that someone beat her record and still diving. So when I know it took us out, uh, we were supposed to go in, this is American Samoa, we were supposed to go in and do a ceremony and um, Nainoa intercepts us, brings them aboard. The other man is uh, the head of the NOAA, Noah, and um, wanted to introduce us to people with the same mission, right? To Malama Honua, to take care of our earth and our oceans. And he wanted them to meet us. 
who have brought the canoe there from Tahiti to the Cook Islands to Samoa and um, look at the faces of who are um, perpetuating the culture of voyaging. Um, and then this day, uh, the tallest man in the middle, that's uh, Tua Pittman. He's from the Cook Islands, a navigator himself, um, a student of Papumau himself, very articulate. And he says to um, the audience there, he says, well, to take this mission, to take this Malamahonu to the next generations, I need you to meet two outstanding, amazing individuals, and that is Kaniala and Leohu. And he mentioned that because they're not just sailors. They're the full package. They're the package that know their culture and proud of it, can share it, um, is, is free to work with all kinds of people. Um, he, he wanted them to know that, that these students, these Arkeiki, um, are that next generation that's going to take this on. Isn't that a payday? Right? That's a huge payday. And um, that, was, that sat heavily on, on both of them, more so on Leohu, because, right, now that's a huge responsibility. That you just got broadcasted to Nainoa and, and all these guys. And so here these hams are, you know, just being themselves. Um, and exactly what we hoped that they would be when they get to experience the canoe and the canoe lifestyle. Um, they, they truly made us proud and made our, they got to sail with original 1976 voyagers. There was Uncle John Cruzy on our canoe and Uncle Billy Richards on our canoe. And that was like going full circle, you know? Those older ones were telling their stories and just so proud of these younger ones. And these are just two. There are many out there on the east side, on the west side of the big island, on all of our islands that are coming up next to us that, that exemplify sustainability of this practice. So there they are, understanding their roles. And um, although it's a heavy role, they, um, they are prepared to take it on. And um, all of your support encourages that. You know, so thank you for showing up because um, I got to tell their story and, and my Kupuna story and those even a Papa Mao who can't tell his story anymore and now it's up to us to continue that story. Um, we got to sail together for the first time on a long distance voyage um, in the most roughest seas, you know, but we had the most faith in each other's um, abilities that there wasn't fear. fear. Fear didn't creep up at all. You, you knew that your canoe was put together well by all the crew members who helped and by the well-trained crew that we have standing shoulder to shoulder. And of course, on the most calm sunrises of days, um, it's the life, you know? Truly the life that we're fortunate to live um, but we could not have done it without all of the land support and all of the land crew, the intentions you folks sent off with us um, is, it is truly felt. Um, so, I know you probably have questions about food. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's a little bit about human resource uh, sustainability. And um, for us with our Makali Ohana, that is, that is very large because never will we want to be back at that place where we have to ask somebody else again for help to find our way. Like um, Leohu, she watches video um, about us trying to find logs big enough to make voyaging canoes. And the faces of some of those men like Clay Bergman, like Papamau, to see their faces of... Um, despair that they could not find ones large enough. That was a saddening feeling for her. She was going to go off to school and be a veterinarian. Nothing wrong with taking care of animals. Of course, that's important. But after watching that video over and over for our student program that we do um, during the summer, something triggered in her, in her gut feeling. And 
after some discussion, she realized that why she was feeling strange was that she felt like she could have done something. I'm a baby girl, you wasn't even born yet. She says, well, I don't know. I don't know about being a vet. I think I want to build an army and help to rebuild our forest. Ja, right? We could not have told her to do that. She had to find her way to do that. And so she and Kaniela are in school. Well, no. They all got called by uh, Tua Pittman, the Cook Island Canoe. When we got home in September, she got called back and uh, she sailed, she sailed uh, Maru Maru Atua, Cook Island Canoe from Aotearoa, uh, from, sorry, from Sydney to New Zealand. Um, so again, that's another <coughs> testament that we probably did pretty good for another captain to call up, bring her up, and say, hey, come crew my canoe. Um, so she's out there still in New Zealand, and Kaniola is home, um, back to school. And so, again, just only two examples of what it takes to be sustainable. Um, we know that we have to reduplicate ourselves. We, I can't be the cook forever. There's got to be somebody else that we're going to tag. And we've got to homegrow them, too. And so, um, thanks to my, my fathers of the ocean, uh, my mama canoes, that allowed us to experience what he va'a, he moku, he moku, he va'a. The canoe is your island, your island is your canoe. Um, but in another sense of sustainability, I was just talking to, um, please say your name again, Crystal? Cynthia, sorry. So Cynthia, she's excited because um, she's a retired teacher and she's got time in her hands. And there's many like her who wants to help with our voyage, uh, provisioning our food in a whole nother way. Um, yes, we can do magic with what we have with canned goods, our modern day preserved foods of spam and corned beef. Um, this time around with Hokulea, we there were some people who, des I didn't design the menu, uh, but I just showed up and you get their menu and you got to make magic. And so this time around, they wanted to uh, try a little bit more healthier items. And so the lentil story came up. <laughs> you guys hear that already? No. So um, we have a menu of five different days. Um, and in one day box, you have your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then there were two of those days that we weren't too sure about. Like we never really, we didn't have training where they, they fed it to us prior to leaving. And so one of them was a tomato orzo. Okay, there was no meat in that. It just said tomato and orzo. So that was kind of a turn off already. And then, and then lentil soup. And we're like, what is lentils? We don't know what lentils are. We, we put that away. So we pretty much ran the three days. And that was a uh, chicken curry, a uh, salmon patty, and uh, I can't remember the other one already. But um, we, 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 would, we would open the hull to find all of our food. And if there was a lentil one, okay, we'll push that on the side. Okay, let's get the other one. Okay, fisherman, get back out there. <laughs> so we're about maybe two days out. And we say, man, we gotta at least try the lentils. We, we can't come all this way and not even just try. So two big bags of lentils. Um, the recipe calls for half a bag of bacon bits. It's Kirkland, kind of big bag. Um, and we had some vegetables left over from um, Aitutaki. We had some eggplant and a few, maybe like one more onion. Okay, so we, we're pretty desperate by now. And I wasn't even sure if I could give up my onion for the lentil soup that I don't even know it's going to work. So it was like, I don't know. Okay, we got to try it. Let's just try it. So we mix it up. And one of my brothers, Kalani Kahaliumi, some of you guys know him, he would help every meal time. He's a number one chopper. He's, he'll go wash the dishes. You know, he's eager to have his next meal. So he's right there. But the lentil soup one came up, you should have seen him. He was like behind the mass and just kind of watching. He, he wouldn't even help. He, he wouldn't even get near. And I'm so kind of worried about that because they're my workhorses, right? They got to eat. 
And um, so we go ahead, we, we mix it all up. Now the next day, I already had a plan for breakfast. We had this, I was gonna make like a, a corned beef ulu patties. Ooh. So I didn't need the other half of the bacon bits. So I says, let's just put the whole bag of bacon bits. That'll make, bacon bits make things better. So throw it all in and it got really thick because it said soup. So I was thinking it would be more watery, but it got thicker and thicker. And before we even prayed for our meal, and we prayed every meal, um, I was getting all apologetic. I was like, man, you guys, I'm sorry, uh, it's kind of thick, but we got mayonnaise and we got Tabasco. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so Kalani is like one of the last guys, you know, he's my gauge at this point. He's one of the last guys to make his plate. And um, man, brother had a second plate, brother had a third plate. And he said, sister, I need that recipe because I'm a mental freak. <laughs> Now this is a brother from Kiopaha, so lentils get chance, I think, they got chance. Um, and I think it was super important that we just try, so that we know that we can tell this story. But I think it would have been better if we tried before, that we wouldn't have had all these anxieties. Because uh, we're down to our last onion, man, and that would have been really messed up if it got ruined. Um, so we have these schools that I'm talking about that are working on pickling things because um, a lot of that vinegar and the pickling would really do well. Um, they're making teas. Um, when I talked about pono packaging, that's super important. On my first voyage, we went to little atolls, so there's no refuse station when you get there. And so my captain and navigator says, okay, Kiala, this is my first time being a cook. Um, you're gonna to have to throw your cans in the ocean. I'm like, what? I, that didn't even occur to me that that would have to happen. And I struggled and struggled with that even before we left, while we're out there, because we're asking the gods for the most fairest winds and weather and, and ocean, and we're greeting all of our ocean creatures on the daily. And I also have to say, I'm sorry. I need to put this in the ocean because it may harm my own crew. They may rust, they may cut each other. Um, one other instance on another voyage, they had a no-no fly infestation where they had to tent the whole canoe. So that was really difficult. I, I would, per well, I'm already a procrastinator by nature, but even when I had to throw the cans away, I would let them pile up in that five gallon bucket. I'd cover it just because it was hard, you know? And so this time going around, how could we improve that? How can we stay away from these tin cans? Um, that's another method that I, I don't know the answer to. You know, I, I'd rather have glass. That way we could reuse the glass. Um, we, we could still store that and make it you know, as safe as possible. Things break, yeah, they could possibly crack on the canoe. But again, if we're just talking about Malama Honua, how can we be the best stewards of that? How are we going to walk the walk, talk, and um, really take care of that? After 30, 40 years of sailing, um, we, we really got to be as innovative as possible. So some uncles, like uh, Gary Eoff, he's um, working with natural packaging. Um, and they, that may work for some things. Um, so again, we're open to anybody's um, help and expertise and um, even salting pork or beef, yeah, and not just coming out of cans. That's gotta be way healthier than coming out of the can from someplace else. So we um, look forward to all of your help. Um, we have a website, uh, Nakalai Va'a. Of course, PVS is another easy website to come and share your mana'o and um, the expertise and um, check out your school gardens because they're already working in um, making tea bags, um, really getting creative, and they have already sent that on the canoes. And um, it's so awesome to have these homemade foods read their letters. You know, that's that's just comfort food for the soul that just you know reaches home faster than a satellite phone sometimes, and even better. Um, but again, 
only a few of us will be on those canoes, and we thank all of you for all of your support um, to allow us to do this, because we couldn't do it without you. Um, yeah. Questions? <laughs> yes. Well, a lot of places don't have a refuse station to take care of their cans anyway. <laughs> so we're, we're just polluting their land for them, you know. Um, so like Papa Mao's Island, a lot of the, their food is really um, coconut, taro, uh, fish. Pretty much that's it. So, yeah, they could throw their natural packaging on the side of their walkways. And so when we were there, what we do see Dinti Moor on the side of the walkways. And that will just be, you know, super hazardous for them too. And so holding 30 days worth of canned goods, that, that would be pretty terrible too. So trying to find alternatives to cans perhaps. Yeah. Yes. First, uh, thank you for telling the whole story. It's very uh, well told, and it's a very important story to tell. Um, uh, this too. Uh, what was the most? Uh, what food did you bring the most of? And two, what food do you think people enjoy the most? Mm, good question. What are the most foods we brought? So what, is the, what is the one food you brought the most of? Mm. The one most food that we brought. The biggie biggie. Might be rice. Might um, be rice, yeah. Because <laughs> then you could eat that with anything, anytime. Okay. Um, what was the most, and what did they like the most? One thing that people, you knew what they were be happy when you put it on the table. Fish, yeah. <laughs> Guaranteed fish. Um, but even fishing wasn't all that great. Either uh, they were biting our skirts that we sent out, or um, say from uh, Aitutaki to Samoa, that was about our longest leg really, of about nine days, and we caught one fish. Oh. When we got to American Samoa, we saw why. They have like these huge ships with all their cargo nets being dragged out, like six, eight of them. Oh, that, that tore my opu up too, man, because we just came from a place like Huahine, who have like basically like a couple system that we have. The own local fishermen uh, dictate how much, when, uh, quantities and quantities of, of fish that they could harvest, and they will um, execute judgment on their own too. They'll just oh, take away your keys for your boat, so now you can't go ahead and fish on your own. You know, so we, we saw um, very extreme ways of, of, of ocean management. And then in American Samoa, where the Golden Arches is our first Ho'ailona. <laughs> and, and these huge big ships, because it's Star Kiss, sorry, Charlie Cannery right there. You know, so um, no, we, we didn't catch a lot of fish, but that brought excitement back to the crew every time we would, you know. Um, let's see, it prepared in our date boxes, I think maybe the salmon patty meals were it, um, because it's kind of fish-like. When we got to Rarotonga, um, families gave us cases of palm corned beef, and that was, uh, uh, I'll put a smile on people's faces, because uh, that's something familiar to us. Um, but my, our crew wasn't very picky at all. They were just thankful it wasn't burnt, and they had lots. <laughs> Good question. Yes? Two questions, actually. Uh, when, when you think about foods that were brought on the canoes, okay, that, the canoe foods, uh, or that, is that something that you folks also would need to, to Yeah. And then the second question is, uh, like, the parish Right. Um, so our canoe foods, our traditional foods, um, yes, we've entertained bringing them, and that too takes training. It takes training for us to remember how to eat, say, fermented foods, you know, and they're very nutritious, yet it's not uh, the, the palate that we're familiar with. But um, 
I think in uh, one of the 90s voyage, they did do that from Marquesas, and they did a study. But there was only like two takers who really wanted to uh, be a part of the study. And, um, but they naturally eat those kind of foods. And that was like Papamau and Okotaba from um, Marquesas. Um, so that, that wasn't a very good study. <laughs> but, um, and your other question, the perishables. So say like eggs. Right, something perishable like that. On our home canoe, we would layer in a five gallon bucket, say a square one, we would layer eggs, rice, eggs, rice, so they, they live good. Um, but we, we kept them down in the hull, so it stayed fairly cool. And um, that would last about a couple of months. But like on the third month, man, no matter how much I washed that rice, it just stank like, like dirty, rotten eggs. Um, other perishable food, like, like um, fresh produce, we just hang them in our nets and then eat them as soon as we can. We eat them first before all the canned kind of things. Um, yeah, not too many other perishable things. We just have to like wolf it down before it gets bad. <laughs> No, no, we had um, vegetables that were freeze-dried, freeze dried. so that was a huge addition to, say, like our curry, um, chicken curry, you know, we could just easily add a bunch of broth in there and reconstitute. That was a, a wonderful um, treat, actually, to have vegetables fresh, sort of. They are making out, you can make a traditional meal, wine or whatever type, and you can use that as well. So prepare the meal first, and then just freeze-dry the whole thing. Nice. You just put a plastic pad on water, however you want to prepare it, but there is a way to do that now. It wasn't always there. True, true. There's some definite. Do you have one of those? There are ways to do that. You can process it. You can do it yourself. Nice. Man, that would really cut a lot of other resources, like the propane. Yeah, the propane usage. And then freeze dry them themselves and then bring it. Yeah. What a great concept. Yes. Oh, yeah, yep. Nice. So mentioning about a fireman and military? Yeah. Yep. MREs. All like survival kind of foods. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Man, the technology has grown so much. So you have a solar cooker or a reflector. Beautiful, because uh, I think like at our most, uh, on our canoe at, at a given time could be like 18 people, you know, and um, other ways to cook quicker, yeah, it means I could sleep longer. <laughs> nice. So it's, um, using again our natural resources to help us go better. Because we went to certain islands where they don't have the same uh, um, hookup system for our propane tank, so like, man, we were almost on rations on that too. Um, yeah, yes? Of my first voyage, 
Like, I swear, he turned vegan just before we left. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna try, bro, I'm gonna try. So, right, I have to cook my um, vegetables and then put that aside and then the meat and then add it together. And um, then, brother, get, we get to our first land uh, near Majuro called Inoko Island and they greet us with uh, a cooler of fosters, a cooler of water, and a, and a pig on a spit. <laughs> and um, my other titas that were on the canoe, they're like, yeah, well, you know all that hard work you did trying to separate the beef for him? I saw him eating the skin. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he told them, that's not meat. <laughs> well, it ain't a vegetable, Bob. <laughs> We, we try our best to keep a loving family <laughs> and, and supply each other with all their needs. Like, I'm not even a coffee maker, but I'll make sure hot water's on and make sure we still got coffee. It's, you got to keep them smiling, right? We, we got to keep going. <laughs> so, um, no, not too many vegans. Um, not anymore. <laughs> They've been converted. <laughs> No, yeah. Right, who did? <laughs> okay, so in my Makali Oahana, um, our cook is Maulili Dixon. And so he went to PBS before the canoe was about to leave. And our new and upcoming other Vao brothers and sisters, they had great ideas on Aipono and uh, but he's been cooking all his life. Like, as soon as he came out of his mama, he was cooking already. And he's all, no, we have to bring oil. They're all like, no, we don't. We don't have to bring oil. <laughs> and he's all, okay, you go catch a fish. What are you going to do with your fish? <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah. Or they didn't want to bring rice. And he's all, you can't do that to our crew. They're going to kill you. <laughs> you got to bring rice. So, um... It's like the Wizard of Oz. I, I don't know exactly who made this um, menu up, but um, they, they tried to get to a happy medium. And then, um, like, Ma Lily and I will bring our own little stash of seasonings and, and those little things that make it a little special, you know. Um, he's a firm believer in Spam. He will die eating Spam, you know. And, um, there's some of us in our generation who's trying to wean ourselves off of Spam, but he, he knows that that's the staple food um, and, and that will survive a long time. So um, he'll, he'll keep to a simple menu. And then for some people that's a comfort food, you know, that's, that's just like home, he'll change too many things. Um, but not too sure exactly who makes the menu. They would work with different captains and navigators, like um, I know Uncle Bruce Winekenfield, his favorite recipe is the Sam Patty one. So that's why they still keep that, you know? So I'm sure the navigators have a say. Um, not too much, but if there's some, uh, he loves it so much that he'll cook it his own way. Like he'll, he'll boot the cook, cook, and then and, uh, he'll have a go and, and, and cook his own salmon patty the way he liked it with mashed potatoes and capers and, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, any questions? Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about water? How do you handle, you know, rationing water? Water, how do we deal with that? Now, our canoes are getting faster and faster. That is quite not the same like just our last voyage at uh, Alicano Maisu. Um, so from Hawaii to Tahiti in this last one, it took them only like 15 days. Ooh. So. And then, a bunch of them never even ate for two weeks because they were sick. Um, so they have a lot of food left over and a lot of water left over. But on my first voyage in 2007, um, it took us 30 days, 27 days to get to Majro. So that's a full canoe worth of food that we would have um, um, consumed. So talking about that model, we had a... Those water jugs with the little handle on the top and a straw, I think that's a, a, a one and a half liter. Um, we had one of those filled every two nights. Okay, so that means you're sipping water. You're not go, 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 right? You 
may or may not use it for brushing teeth, right? Depending on how much you drink and are dependent on your water. Now, Shorty, he is super disciplined. As a navigator, he drank maybe an inch off of the top of his water jug. So came the second night, the other brothers were all, oh, well, he, he don't need this. <laughs> and they started drinking his water. But they weren't thinking about the idea that your best water is your home water. So we should have been saving that water. And every time we went to us land, um, we had already had a range for water. Um, so in Majuro, we, we loaded up in Majuro. Our worst water uh, on our last voyage right here uh, on our Lake 2 was um, in Bora Bora. It wasn't a secured source, I would say. They went up and up and up in the mountain and ended up being this huge black container that they were siphoning it out of, and it tasted bad, you know? So um, other places, like our first stop was in Tautira. We flew to Tautira, we filled up water there, and, and that was pristine. So it's really about relationships. Is knowing where your water source is coming from. Usually, when we went to Bora Bora, they say they went to the um, bar, <laughs> and uh, um, they had a filtration system there. Um, I'm not sure why they didn't go with that. I think um, you know some community member says, "Oh, I got good water. Come with me. I got a truck. Load it up," and and we, we kind of bombed that one. You know, like I, I would use that one for cooking. You know, I tried to cook that one more. We try, I, we try to identify which were those bottles. Um, when our last, another stop in Rarotonga, we had a more secure source that was uh, a family member's church. And they had an awesome filtration system where all the church members come. And basically the people of that Ahupua'a come to fill their water. So sometimes it's a hit and miss. But sometimes it's, um, that's your water source that they, the voyage has been using years after years, voyage after voyage. And that, that's hugely important because we tried to put um, tang in the water and, and, and limes and lemons and just, ugh, you know, didn't quench the thirst. Yes? Shower. How often did you guys shower and where and how? <laughs> When you say you guys, that's kind of huge in general. <laughs> now, me every day, right? I, I, I got to sleep clean, right? So um, showers. At the back of the canoe is your bathrooms. Um, you choose wisely on the wind direction. Um, but it's also your bathroom and there's a shower, like a curtain, a really dense curtain. And that's your only little, what, Sessie, maybe like two and a half feet by four feet wide is your area. You got a, maybe a three gallon, two gallon bucket because water is like seven pounds per gallon. So you don't want to put the five gallon bucket over and then just phew. And some of us lost a bucket or three, but um, <laughs> that's how you do it. I'm um, shower. You throw your bucket over, reach yourself off, shampoo up, throw your bucket over again. Uh, I would be butt naked, wash my clothes, so I do two for one. And then um, hang up that clothes, put on another one, and every day just kind of switch off the clothesline. <laughs> yeah, so otherwise, if it's a really cold night or, and, and it's just you're too late for your shower, you don't want to get all cold, then it's baby wipes. <laughs> Magic of baby wipes. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> Those are the top three right there. Sleep. Use the bathroom and eat. So we have a saying on our canoe, um, one hand for the canoe, one hand for you. So it's off the side, off of our Okulea and Makali'i. Um, we have like a plank on the outside. We call it a catwalk that's parallel to the hull. It's only a two by 12. So you're basically standing on that, one hand for the canoe, one hand for you. <laughs> Yeah, and if you catch the swell, then no need wipe. <laughs> <laughs> on super cold nights, I won't tell them, but I'll use the bucket inside and I'll just sit on the bucket. Oh. <laughs> yeah, a catheter wouldn't be bad, man, because some nights it's just super cold and you don't want to get naked. And so our Project Runway people, we need you to help design foul weather gear for Wahine. 
Okay? Because by the time you take off your harness, your jacket, your 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 bib with your, your uh, overalls, and then your shorts, maybe if you wore underwear, that's what was that, six garments already? Duh. It's exhausting. You have to plan that. Now you gotta get out of your sleeping compartment too, right? Book it out of your sleeping compartment, shoot to the back, hoping no one's back there already using the bathroom, and then get naked. Oh man, it's a wake-up call already. You're up. <laughs> um, yeah. Quick questions, guys. Any more? That's what. Yep. Yeah. Oh, we we had the full gambit, didn't we, Setsi? We we had going moving backwards, not doing anything to um, 55 mile an hour winds, about 20 foot seas. Oh. Um, that night was a really, really, really cold one. Um, if we had more of that weather during the day and the night again, a lot of us would have been in bad shape just with hypothermia perhaps. You know, we were soaked to the bone and frozen with gale force winds just really frozen that um that forced our captains um chad babayan and, and chad paishan to write home to Nino and pbs that hey if we want to go around the world we need to fully equip the canoe with proper foul weather gear some of our crew members are just coming on for a leg or two may not be experienced to know what kind of gear to purchase or can invest that much to purchase that so um that was uh, a, a really good experience and unfortunately, nobody got um, hurt. But we've also found out some um, unconventional ways to stay warm. Like Uncle John Cruz, he busted out the, the sail bags that was nice and warm in their big bin and said, hey, put your feet in here just to stay warm. You know, some, some bags are so huge or some crew was so small that they could get right into it like a sleeping bag and stay warm. But, you know, that was kind of sacrilege almost uh, a part of us because that's that's your motor, that's your engine, that's your sail. You know, we, we take care of that, but what good is that if we, we we're, we're dysfunctional already, you know? So, um, yeah, we, we, we had some maybe a day and a half of really bad weather and, and was just fine, you know? Um, the waves were really huge, but again, there wasn't fear. You felt like you were at the right place. Well, I felt, I don't know about everybody else. I felt like I was at the right place at the right time, meant to do, meant to be who I was meant to be, and just wanted to go, woohoo! You know, because we're surfing these huge waves on a 64 foot canoe, you know, and, and it's just reverberating under your feet, and, and, and you just knew that, wow. Oh, Mahalo to everybody who let me be here yeah. <laughs> and just, just live the dream, you know? Um, yeah. Wow, you guys, I can't believe this many people came to hear me blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> about sustainability is about your human resources, the human side of it, your succession plan, if you will. So know that when you guys leave here, kind of question yourself, what is your sustainability plan? Who is going to take over for you? Have you trained your keiki, your grandkids, and everything that you want to pass down to them, their traditions, their culture, whatever heritage, recipes? That is one of the biggest things that, um, biggest regrets is when one of our kupuna passed away is like, oh, I wish I knew how to cook their salmon patties or something like that, yeah? So make sure that you think about those things, but then also understand that you are somebody else's sustainability plan too, yeah? So know where you stand in somebody else's bigger picture. With that, mahalo nui loa. Thanks again to Matson and Russell and your ohana for being here tonight and for putting on wayfinding talks such as these, kiala. You are solid. Awesome. Everybody have a great night. Aloha.